Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled, In the Crucible with Christ. Hmm, that sounds like an interesting challenge. We're on lesson number nine in that series for August 27, entitled, A Life of Praise. Praise in the Crucible? Well, let's begin with the word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to gather with friends and talk about you. Forgive us where we may have failed you and help us to take up these challenges that we're studying together and find out how we can live lives closer to your ideals. Our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is praise? What role does it supposed to have? Is it supposed to have in the, in the life of a Christian? Is It's easy to praise God when everything is going fine and you're thankful. But is it possible for a Christian to praise God when things are not going well? In fact, when the worst possible situations imaginable, maybe that is a time when we need to um, we need God the most. We may not be able to change the circumstances which seem forbidding at the time, but we can change ourselves. We can remind ourselves that we are children of the King, the Heavenly King, and He has already won the great controversy. That ought to be a perk, don't you think? Praise is actually faith doing what it is supposed to do. Jim? From the Bible study guide, the BSG, the great Russian writer Fyodor Dostoevsky had been sentenced to death, only to have the sentence commuted at the last moment. He spent years in prison instead. Talking about his prison experience, he wrote, quote, believe in the end, even if all men go astray and you are left the only one faithful, Bring your offering even then and praise God in your loneliness. From the Bible Study Guide for August 21. Do you remember the stories of Paul and Silas in Philippi? After starting a church there and preaching there for several weeks, he was accosted by that demon-possessed young woman until fi Paul finally turned on her and cast out her demon. Supposedly, as a result of that demon possession, she was able to predict the future, and so she had some handlers which were making good money on that. As a result, her managers incited the crowd to get Paul and Silas imprisoned. I do not know if it was because of that experience. However, it turned out that the church at Philippi was very supportive of Paul. Is that why he wrote these encouraging words to them? <clears throat> Carrie? Reading from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. May you always be joyful in your union with the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Show a gentle attitude towards everyone. The Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything, but in all your prayers, ask God for what you need, always asking Him with a thankful heart. And God's peace, which is far beyond human understanding, will keep your hearts and minds safe in union with Christ Jesus. That's from American Bible Society, 1992. Let me just um, <clears throat> give a little background there. The book of Philippians was probably written just before Paul was released from that Roman prison during his first imprisonment. Of course, at the end of his second imprisonment in Rome, he was beheaded. But at the end of the first imprisonment, he had written Galatians and Ephesians. And then a short time later, he wrote Philippians. And he, was he already had an idea that he was going to be released from prison. So maybe he had a reason for praise. However, that first imprisonment, do you remember what his conditions were during that first imprisonment, imprisonment in Rome? Very different than his second imprisonment. The first imprisonment, he actually ha was able to hire his own house and he had the Roman guards were there, they were chained to him, but he was, he was conducting evangelistic efforts in his house there um, in the middle of Rome. Of course, the second time he was in prison, he was in the, um, forgotten what it's called now, that dungeon. He was underground. Yeah, underground. Uh, right, uh, yeah. Uh, there was a little hole. Uh, you've yep, been there, I've right? been there. Yes, Mamertine prison, that's right, thank yeah, you. Right. 
Was Paul living in some kind of fairyland when he told us to praise always? We just read that in Philippians 4, 4. How is that possible? If indeed we're going to praise at all times, that must mean that we are to praise God when things are not going well. Is that phony? What, what is praise really? Is it, well, is it uh, does God need praise? And I think the answer is no. He doesn't need it, but he, well, yes, in a sense he does. He wants us to praise him because he's hoping that will influence other people to, to. If, if we're telling the truth about him, what greater honor. Uh, well, that uh, is praise. Uh, I understand, but why do we call it praise? I praise you, I praise you, praise No, just when you start telling the truth about uh, it. No, it, we're not saying it's some mantra or something like that. No, it's praise <clears throat> means that we're speaking the truth well, about but, God. Uh, yeah, but uh, modern, uh, praise it seems to be like a, a needle stuck on the old record. You yeah. know, praise you, praise that's, you. That's why I raised uh, yes, the issue. Yes, I'm so glad yeah, you no, brought it, this. I was well, going to. Uh, you you can be sure that the devil has his own phony versions of praise. Uh, however, to praise, uh, you ask me to do something and I go ahead and do it. And in my doing it, I, that's a, you're honoring you're on, I'm honoring you, you see, and the, the the same right. same that's value. how I praise hey yeah. Yeah. I like the man he asked me to do it I'm gonna do it doesn't matter what the cost is it does not yeah. matter so that's to me is much more praise much more involved it's an action thing versus yeah. uh, saying you know we're on the same wavelength we're gonna, I, I, I like that we're um, we're gonna go on a little bit later in this lesson we're gonna talk about Praise being a kind of witnessing, and well, oh, sure. oh, absolutely, there you go. Yeah. Right. The witnessing must be telling the truth. Yeah, exactly. Okay? Not not some uh, a lot of the accretions that are not biblical, mm -hmm. and people parrot those things. Yeah, Dwayne, I guess you can help us there. Okay. Just as faith is not is based not on our circumstances, but rather on the truth about God, so praise is something we do not be. We do not because we feel good, but because of the truth of who God is and what He has promised us. And amazingly, it is such faith that begins to shape our thoughts, feelings, and circumstances. That's from our Bible study guide. In order to understand why we can rejoice in faith in God, we need to understand more about faith itself. The best definition of faith that I know of was developed gradually and after much study by A. Graham Maxwell, my mentor, personal mentor, helped me with my a master's degree in religion. Summarizing much of what the Bible and Ellen White have said on the subject, he concluded, as he stated many times in his classes, Faith is just a word we use to denote a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better this relationship may be. We cannot say will be because we know the story of Lucifer. Faith implies an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deep admiration. It means having enough confidence in him based upon the more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe whatever he says, as soon as we are sure that he is the one who has said it, to accept whatever he self offers, as soon as we are sure that he is the one who, has, who is offering it, and to do whatever he wishes, as soon as we are sure he is the one who wishes it, without reservation for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith is perfectly safe to save. This is why faith is the only requirement for heaven. Faith also means Abraham, Job, Moses, God's friends, who knew God well enough to reverently ask him why. Wow. This is Abraham Maxwell, yes. Think about all the people who think it's, it's just unthinkable for you to question God in any way. Ask God? Challenge Him? Why? No, that's completely wrong. What, what teacher uh, doesn't, isn't honored by a person asking questions and, and then res wrestling with the Well, they should answer. be. Exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, 
And Jesus was known as a teacher yeah. and not as a penalty payer. What truths about God make it possible for you to praise even in very difficult times? Does God expect us to continue praising him even if we are suffering through the seven last plagues? We should praise God for many reasons, including the following. Here's just some ideas. God created us, John 1, 1 to 3. Two, God is love, 1 John 4, 8 and 16. Three, he has already won the great controversy through the life and death of his son, Jesus Christ, Romans 8, 3. Four, he has promised us life eternal with him if we are faithful. For what more could we ask? There are several re very remarkable stories in the Bible about how God fought for his people at times when they had a relatively good relationship with him. The children of Israel were, had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and finally arrived on the banks of the Jordan River, looking across the flooded river at Jericho. Maybe they were thinking that God would take them across a comfortable river into grassy plains where their animals could feed. What they saw across the river instead was a powerful, fortified city of Jericho. Finally, God assisted them by providing a dry path through the flooded Jordan River. And they camped not far from Jericho on the western side of the river. They had entered the land of Palestine. And what was the result? Joshua 6, verses 1, 1 to 20. The gates of Jericho were kept shut and guarded to keep the Israelites out. No one could enter or leave the city. The Lord said to Joshua, I am putting into your hands Jericho, with its king and all of its brave soldiers. You and your soldiers are to march around the city once a day for six days. Then on the seventh day, after marching around seven times. So the, this is, I'm, I'm trying to cut the thing a little bit short here. So the priests blew the trumpets. As soon as the people heard it, they gave a loud shout and the walls collapsed. Then all the army went straight up the hill into the city and captured it. With their swords, they killed everyone in the city, men and women, young and old. They also killed the cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Now, is that necessary, killing the cattle, the sheep, and the donkeys? Well, it's interesting to know that archaeologists has pointed out some things about the Jericho situation. There was a very steep stone ramp, and then above that, a a wall made out of mud bricks and the wall was designed specifically so that you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to climb up it under any circumstance he said there were two walls yeah there's one like this and then another one straight up mm -hmm. and the and so when they shouted you know people think well god shouted they must have made such a lot of noise they just blew the the walls in no the walls were blown out <laughs> we'll read about that in a moment um, but, earthquake, huh? an earthquake. Well, they went up, every wall, every <coughs> wall all went out on both sides. That was not what, if it was an earthquake, it would, they would both go in the same direction. Anyway, the point is, when that brick wall collapsed down over the other thing, it made a, a rough climbing area. The, the guys, could, people could just climb right up there and into the city. Back at Mount Sinai. Wasn't, wasn't a, a, excuse me, Rahab living in the wall of the city? Yes, the, yes. Uh, is, and that is, part of the wall was not destroyed. Yeah. That break. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the northern end of the wall is not destroyed. Still there. You might have been asked this question 10,000 times, but I thought that uh, and maybe a quick answer. Uh, was it a sequence? One uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So did the kid do the killing on the Sabbath or did they take a break? And then, Well. I'm sure you have been asked this. Before. Yes. It, it's, it, it implies, it seems to be that. We can't know for sure. Um, but, you know, the numbering off it, the way it's numbered, and we know the, day, the days are normally numbered by the Jews, that's the way they're numbered. So, it's hypothetically correct. That's one of the questions I want to ask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what really happened? Back at Mount Sinai, God had told them, as regarded in Exodus 23, that he would take them into the land and that he would take care of their enemies and they would not even have to fight. But they were not happy with that, despite God's repeated assurances. Finally, they insisted on fighting. So they ended up fighting with the Amalekites and Sihon and his nation and Og and his nations. And finally, they were facing Jericho. God wanted them to see that if they would only trust fully and completely in Him, He would take care of them. If one studies the history of Israel carefully, 
she or he will see that when they went to war following God's directions, they never lost. In fact, they sometimes did not even lose a single soldier. But when they went to war without consulting God, they always lost and sometimes were totally devastated. Now you would think after a while someone would get that picture. <laughs> it is interesting to see that while God planned to conquer the city on their behalf, he did not do everything. He wanted them to do their part. Their part was what? March around the city. Do it again the next day. Six days in a row. Finally the seventh day, around there seven times. I don't know whether they were making the people inside the city dizzy or what. <laughs> um, well, uh, would you have felt after, after doing all that, how would you have felt about the chances of conquering the city with those big walls? Would you be ready to praise God? Would you be willing to sing the following psalm? Well, there's a psalm that talks about that. Psalm 145, I believe. What was it that made the Israelites successful after marching around Jericho? How would you explain Hebrews 1130? Now, here's a challenge. Thinking about the children of Israel, all they had been through, and they just had finished spending a month at least on in the plain of Baal Peor, and with that mix up with the Medianite and, and Moabite women and all that stuff where thousands of them died. And now we read, he was 1130, it was faith that made the walls of Jericho fall down after the Israelites had marched around them for seven days. Um, whose faith was that? <laughs> Did the children of Israel really have faith? Or was it Joshua's faith? Or was it... Mm. But they followed. They followed what Joshua yeah. told them to do. So, Here's a note on what I mentioned earlier. Archaeologists have discovered some interesting things about the conquest of Jericho. The walls of Jericho fell outward, not inward. Mm -hmm. They were pushed down by God himself or his angels, except for the area where Rahab lived, which is at the northern end of the city so that the rubble would provide a path up the steep incline, allowing the Israelites to quickly march into the city and destroy the shocked and unexpecting citizens. They thought, with that wall around them, eh, those crazy people out there, they're never going to get in here. Well, what about you? Do you trust God? Is it reasonable to trust Him even when we face what seem to be insurmountable obstacles like the wall of Jericho? Um, do you agree that God has a, one, has a thousand ways to take care of things of which we know nothing? Here's a very interesting statement from Desire of Ages. Our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. Those who accept the one principle of making the service and honor of God supreme will find perplexities, vanish, and a plain path before their feet. I mean, Think about Jericho. You think, there's those walls, there's no way any human, normal human could get up those walls, and all of a sudden, whoosh, if I'm right on in, there you are. If I could ask you quickly, one, uh, one, uh, the inner wall was straight up. Okay, there, there was a kind of a ramp on the outside, which up at a steep, a steep angle, which right. was hard enough to climb. Right. And then there was a straight up wall above that. Right. And the straight up wall then collapsed outward, outward, mm -hmm. falling down on that ramp wall, making it possible for, for the Israelites to just scramble up over the broken bricks and things and right into the city. Yeah, uh, you talked about it before, uh, about two walls. So the first wall then was really a ramp. Yes. That is but pretty was, hard to climb up. It's not right to call it a ramp. Uh, they, no, it, wasn't intended, it wasn't intended to be climbed. Right. But it was, uh, yeah. It was a steep a slope. It was a slope, steep slope. Yeah. Steep slope that people were not able to climb yeah. up. So, yeah. okay. And you would expect, under normal circumstances, if you started to climb up at that angle, the the people from Jericho would be standing on top of the wall, throwing rocks and things down at you. How can we develop a life of praise? Look at the things about which David praised God. If you read. Psalm 145, verses 1 to 21, you'll discover that David recognized that God was great and mighty, and he says so several times. He is kind, merciful, shows great love. 
He cares for those in trouble and provides food for all living things. Jim? The great British preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon wrote a book called The Practice of Praise. It is based on verse 7 of today's psalm, Psalms 145. In this short verse, Spurgeon calls our attention to three important things that can help in developing praise in our lives. Give me just a moment. Let's go ahead and look at that verse 7. We'll just read that verse. I don't have time to read the whole chapter. They will tell about all your goodness and sing about your kindness. Though so That's the, the um, verse that Spurgeon was focusing on. Okay. Okay, paragraph one, number one is praise is practiced as we look around us. If we do not look around us to see the greatness of God, we will have no reason to praise him. What can you see in the created world that is praiseworthy, such as the beauty of God's creation? What can you see in the spiritual world that is praiseworthy, such as the growing faith as a, excuse me, in a young Christian? Paragraph two, praise is practiced as we remember what we have seen. If we want to live in an atmosphere of praise, we must be able to recall the reason for it. In what ways can we remember the great things about God, such as by developing new rituals or symbols that remind us of his, good, of his goodness, so that his goodness and truth have, excuse me, so that his goodness and truth about him do not slip from our hands? Our minds. Or from our minds. Yeah, I, mean, I can't read Excuse <laughs> me just a moment. Um, he, you talked there about the beauty of God's creation. My wife and I are working on a puzzle that's pretty complicated, um, but it's a collection of a whole bunch of different flowers and all beautiful, beautiful paint, uh, flowers and all the subtle colors and so forth. Just amazing when you see all that. And here we are trying to put, you know, think about God's put this all together. And here we are trying to match the pieces and the colors and so forth. It's really amazing. Okay, number three. Uh, praise is practice as we talk about it. Praise is not something that we do in our heads. It is meant to come out of our mouths to be heard by those around us. What reason can you think of to praise God verbally? What will be the effect of such praise be and on whom? From the Bible Study Guide for August 23rd. So, think about all the reasons we have for praising God. The more you know about God, the more there is to be excited about and for which to praise Him. Another significant story in the Bible connected to praise is the story of Paul and Silas in Philippi. We mentioned that earlier. Let's get into it a little bit more. Look at the story in Acts 16. After being followed and troubled by a demon-possessed young woman for weeks, Paul cast the demon out of her. Her owners, so-called, were not happy, and they accused Paul and Silas of being against the Roman government. Carrie? Reading from Acts 16, verses 16 through 34. Then the officials tore the clothes off Paul and Silas and ordered them to be whipped. After a severe beating, they were thrown into jail, and the jailer was ordered to lock them up tight. Upon receiving this order, the jailer threw them in the inner cell and fastened their feet between heavy blocks of wood. Let me interrupt for just a second there. Do you remember what happened when they finally got out and the jailer let them out, and then Paul and Silas called for the city authorities. He said, do you happen to know that we are Roman citizens and they just about perished on the spot? <laughs> Go ahead. But uh, that, this was the, the time that he ended up going to Rome because he appealed. No, this, this, is, uh, this no, is not the time. This, no, this is, this is uh, not that time. This was before that. Okay. Go ahead. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake which shook the prison to its foundations. At once all the doors opened, the chains fell off all the prisoners. The jailer woke up and, what he, 
When he saw the prison doors open, he thought that the prisoners had escaped, so he pulled out his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul shouted at the top of his voice, don't harm yourself, we're all here. Mm. The jailer called for a light, rushed in and fell trembling at the feet of Paul and Silas. Then he led them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, believe, trust, have faith in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your family. Then they preached the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that very hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and he and all his family were baptized at once. Then he took Paul and Silas up into his house and gave them some food to eat. He and his family were filled with joy because they now believed in God. That's from the Good News Bible. Now, <clears throat> I have had the privilege of visiting Philippi, and there's a little tiny spot there that they said, this is a prison, except that all the knowledgeable people say, there's no way this could be the actual prison that Paul was kept in. But anyway, you wonder, I mean, surely this jailer didn't make all those quick decisions just as a result of a few minutes that were happened there. They, he must have heard, they must have been in prison for a while, and he heard them talking and speaking, and even the other prisoners must have heard all this sort of stuff that, I mean, Paul didn't just sit there in, in, in jail and, and be quiet. I'm sure he did, he was evangelizing the whole time he was there. Yeah. And he was not on salary. He was not on salary. So why did this event cause the jailer to focus on his own need of salvation? Was he just asking, what can I do to be safe? What role do you think Paul and Silas's prayers and songs played in the rest of the prisoners not running away and in the conver conversion of the jailer and his fa whole family? Was Paul really suggesting that faith is the only requirement for salvation? If so, what is implied by that? If we have a loving, trusting relationship with God, wouldn't that take care of everything at least in the end? We are told that there are three main things which we need to do as a part of being a Christian. Our study, Bible study, prayer, and witnessing to others. Is it possible that by praising and witnessing to others we might actually lead some to develop a relationship with God so that they can be saved for eternity? Yes. So now, a question for you. How would the average person in our world today respond to respond if and when she or he hears us praising God. Suppose you walk down the streets of San Bernardino or some other large city and start praising God out loud. Depends where you did it and how much. <laughs> Somebody's got to round you up. <laughs> yeah, it's very possible. It seems, seems crazy anyway. Um, do these words from Paul still apply to us, or is this um, nonsense now? Duane, are you? I'll go ahead and Charles, can you do read us sure. Philippians, Philippians there? 1, 29, 30. For you have been given the privilege of serving Christ, not only by believing in Him, but also by suffering for Him. Now you can take part with me in battle. It is the same battle you saw me fighting in the past, and as you hear, the one I am fighting still. Wow. So Paul, remember, calls, I have fought the good fight. Remember that? I finished my course. Uh, Second Timothy chapter 4, verse mm -hmm. 12, and he says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer, suffer persecution. persecution. Yeah. And that will happen. This is a battle. Yes, this is a battle. After the days of King Solomon, the nation split into two parts, as you know. The northern kingdom was called Israel, and the southern kingdom was called Judah. One of the earlier kings in the southern kingdom of Judah, a descendant of King David, was named Jehoshaphat. That's quite a name. On, a, on one occasion, the armies of three different countries joined together to attack him and invade Judah. And their plan was to install one of their puppet people to be the new governor of Judah. So we have a fairly 
vigorous discussion of what happened. Duane, you want to take that on? Sure. Second Chronicles 20, verses 1 to 30. Sometime later, the armies of Moab and Ammon, together with their allies, the Munites, invaded Judah. Some messengers came and announced to King Jehoshaphat, a large army from Edom has come from the other side of the Dead Sea to attack you. They've already captured Hazazon Tamar. This is another name for Engedi. <clears throat> Jehoshaphat was frightened and prayed to the Lord for guidance. Then he gave orders for a fast to be observed throughout the country. Mm. From every city of Judah, people hurried to Jerusalem to ask the Lord for guidance. And they and the people of Jerusalem gathered in the new courtyard of the temple. King Jehoshaphat went and stood before them and prayed aloud. <laughs> o Lord God of our ancestors, you rule in heaven over all the nations of the world. You are powerful and mighty, and no one can oppose you. You are our God. When your people Israel moved into this land, you drove out the people who were living here and gave the land to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, to be theirs forever. They have lived here and have built a temple to honor you, knowing that if any disaster struck them to punish them, a war, an epidemic, or a famine, then they could come and stand in front of this temple where you are worshipped. They could pray to you in their trouble, and you would hear them and rescue them. Now the people of Ammon, Moab, and Edom have attacked us. When our ancestors came out of Egypt, you did not allow them to enter those lands, so our ancestors went around them and did not destroy them. This is how they repay us. They come to drive us out of the land that you gave us. You are our God. Punish them, for we are helpless in the face of this large army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but we look to you for help. So now, considering that kind of prayer, what do you suppose God would tell him to do? Let me give you some new swords, some new spears. Um, let me send you some recruits from Egypt or something like that. Well, look what happened. All the men of Judah, with their wives and children, were standing there in the te at the temple. The Spirit of the Lord came upon a Levite who was present in the crowd. His name was Jehaziel, son of Zechariah. He was a member of the clan of Asaph and was descended from Asaph through Madaniah, Jael, and Benaiah. Jehaziel said, Your Majesty, and all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, the Lord says that you must not be discouraged or be afraid to face this large army. The battle depends on God, not on you. Attack them tomorrow as they come up the pass at Ziz. You will meet them at the end of the valley that leads to the wild country near Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Just take up your positions and wait. You will see the Lord give you victory. People of Judah and Jerusalem, do not hesitate or be afraid. Go out to battle, and the Lord will be with you. Wow. Okay, what would you expect to happen under those circumstances? Go ahead. Early the next morning, the people went out to the wild country near Tekoa. As they were starting out, Jehoshaphat addressed them with these words, People of Judah and Jerusalem, put your trust in the Lord your God, and you will stand firm. Believe what his prophets tell you, and you will succeed. After consulting with the people, the king ordered some musicians to put on their robes they wore on sacred occasions, and to march ahead of the army, singing, Praise the Lord, his love is eternal. Okay, now let's stop for a second. We talk about putting the tanks up front and sending the aircraft up front. How would you like to send the choir out at the front? <laughs> mm. Does that sound like total Sheep craziness? To the <laughs> wow. Okay. When they began to sing, the Lord threw the invading armies into a panic. The Ammonites and the Moabites attacked the Edomite army and completely destroyed it and then they turned on each other in savage fighting. When the Judean army reached a tower that was in the desert, they looked towards the enemy and saw that they were all lying on the ground, dead. 
Not one had escaped. Wow. Isn't that the way that... Think how we could, Imagine a, a war being caught, fought like that in our day. How would it be reported in the newspapers? <laughs> Not fairly, for sure. Amen. <laughs> 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 wow. And looking at that story, do you wonder how long it took for Jehoshaphat to call the nation to a fast? How long would it take for the people to gather in Jerusalem? What were their enemies doing during that time? Were they looting the country? Now, if you know a little bit about the geography of the country, they had to come around the Dead Sea. I'm sure they didn't go across the Dead Sea. They had to come around the Dead Sea somewhere or other. And En Gedi was a small town on the western side of the Dead Sea. And so apparently they actually conquered that city or they overran it or whatever. And then they were getting ready to climb the pass that it talks about up toward Jerusalem and, and attack Jerusalem. So that was the story. That's what was, was, was happening there. So what about you now? If you were approached by a vast army of problems in our day, what would be the first thing that would come to your mind to do? Today, what kind of situations might seem like a vast army attacking you? My son-in-law just had a friend, a very close friend of his, that they were best of friends from, from grade school, just passed away from multiple organ collapse and so forth like this, really. Young, huh? Yeah, 50s. Yeah, really, really sad. But unfortunately, uh, we had some idea this was coming because he refused to take care of himself. He ate whatever he felt like eating, he drank whatever he felt like drinking, and really sad we we pleaded with him a few times i mean you you know you don't what do you do you can't come along at the end of someone's life or near the end of someone's life and tell them how to straighten things up he grew up a believer what did he grow up a believer no no, no he was not mm -hmm. um, well in looking at that story do you wonder how long it took for jehoshaphat to call the people we talked about that if you're approached by a vast army what would you do? A life-threatening illness? A bad accident? Loss of a family member or friend? How did the people know that it was Yahweh who was speaking through, to, through Jehaziel? Today, how can we know if someone is being guided by God and speaking on God's behalf? Imagine going out with your military, led by the choir, to face three enormous armies. You know, that's not a whole lot different than the Exodus 14, 14. Mm -hmm. He says, I'll fight for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But people, they, they, they want to be involved. They, well, want, they, they want to... S well, unfortunately, <laughs> isn't, isn't that what, was, what was happening here is, if you look at Exodus 23, go back to Exodus 23, God gave them very specific instructions. If you will follow me, follow my directions, I will take care of your enemies. If necessary, I will, I will chase them away with hornets. I, I will do whatever is necessary. Uh, you won't have to fight at all. Yeah. But the children of Israel said, but if we don't fight and we don't fight with our swords, no one will think we're a great military. Mm -hmm. They won't think we're important. They won't think we're any kind of... You know, I, that one just blows me away. You know, because they believed... People in those days believed that if you conquered another country's army, that means your God was more powerful than theirs. Okay? That was a common belief. But what's the so, most powerful Yeah. if you don't do anything and your God does everything? That, that's irrefutable proof. You would have thought. I, I don't know what they were thinking. Ellen White had some very significant things to say about praise, since that's our discussion here. Then let us educate our hearts and lips to speak the praise of God for His matchless love. Let us educate our souls to be hopeful and abide in the light shining from the cross of Calvary. Never should we forget that we are children of the Heavenly King, sons and daughters of the Lord's Lord of Force. It is our privilege to maintain a calm response in God. Ellen White, Ministry of Healing, page 253, paragraph 1. Ellen White 
and while I was adored and magnifying him, when I, and while I adored and magnified him, I want you to magnify him with me. Praise the Lord even when you fall into darkness. Praise him even in temptation. Rejoice in the Lord always, says the apostle. And again, I say rejoice, Philippians 4, 4. Will that bring gloom and darkness into your families? No, indeed. It will bring sun brim. You will thus gather rays of eternal light from the throne of glory and scatter them around you. Let me exhort you to engage in this work, scatter the light and life around you, not only in your own path, but in the paths of those with whom you associate. Let it be your object to make those around you better and elevate them to point them to heaven and glory and lead them to seek above all earthly things the eternal substance, the immortal inheritance, the riches which are imperishable. Ellen White Testimonies to Church, Volume 2, page 593. This is all praise that she is talking yeah. about. There's yeah. nothing but praise. Mm -hmm. We've already suggested that the ultimate reason for Christians to praise God is because in the end, He will be our Savior and Lord. Amen. John 5, 28 and 29 and Daniel 12, 2 suggest, they state very specifically that everyone will be raised back to life at some point. Some will be raised to live forever, those who are raised at the second coming. Others will be raised to see their final events and the truth about God and then to perish at the third coming. <clears throat> There's one very interesting aspect of that final judgment scene, which of which many are not aware. And I see I misspelled scene there. It should be S-C-E-N-E, -E, not S-E-E-N. Forgive me. Think of the story of Achan as recorded in Joshua 7. Achan committed a terrible sin by stealing things from Jericho and hiding them in his tent. Now, I don't know, you know, I, I laugh when I, when I see artists picturing the children of Israel camped at the foot of Mount Sinai. You see, and all lined up there, neat little U.S. Army tents, so <laughs> <laughs> we don't know what kind of tents these were that people were, were living, but I'm sure they were sprawling, they were out like this, and I'm sure that when Achan buried this treasure in his house, inside his tent, his kids probably helped him. He probably forced them to help him. The whole family was involved. Well, anyway, um, he compounded that problem by his reluctance to admit his sins. Ellen White commenting on that occasion gave us some very serious words. Aiken would not have confessed had he not hoped by so doing to avert the consequences of his crime but his confession only served to show that his punishment was just. There was no genuine repentance for sin, no contrition, no change of purpose, no abhorrence of evil. So confessions will be made by the guilty when they stand before the bar of God. Now, when will this be? When does everybody, the whole universe stand before the bar of God? When is that going to happen? At the third coming. At the third coming. The wicked will be outside the city and the righteous will be inside the city. The whole, <clears throat> everybody. And of course, the onlooking universe will be watching. Um, after every case has been decided for life or death, that's in the pre-advent judgment, the consequences to result to himself will draw from each an acknowledgement of his sin. It will be forced from the soul by an awful sense of condemnation and a fearful looking for of judgment. But such confessions cannot save the sinner. So long as they can conceal their transgressions from their fellow men, many, like Achan, feel secure and flatter themselves that God will not be strict to mark iniquity. All too late their sins will find them out in that day when they shall not be purged with sacrifice or offering forever. When the records of heaven shall be opened, the judge will not in words declare to man his guilt, but will cast one penetrating, convicting glance in every deed, 
every transaction of life will be vividly impressed upon the mind of the wrongdoer. Imagine one look from God and you remember every sin you've ever committed. The person will not, as in Joshua's day, need to be hunted out from tribe to family, but his own lips will confess his shame. The sins hidden from the knowledge of men will then be proclaimed to the whole world. Outside the New Jerusalem, which has come down to settle on the earth here now, is this vast multitude of sinners, the wicked. And as God looks out on them, they are be, every one of them is going to be confessing his own sins. Why did I do this? Why did I do that? Patriarchs and Prophets 497 to 498. That's a, that's a scene that's just unbelievable to even imagine. Oh, yeah, how will the righteous look, look upon that? Well, that's a good question. Will we be able to see individuals that we know? Will we be able to tell what they're saying? Why wouldn't we? We should be able to, I think. Anyway, the I, point I, is... I think, that would, I think that will actually e either eliminate or certainly clarify a lot of questions people might have yep. throughout that next millennium. The point is, when that happens, or as it happens, every single being, the wicked on the outside and the righteous on the inside and all the onlooking universe will realize that God did everything he possibly could to save as many as possible. That the great controversy cannot come to a conclusion until that happens. So n no one will be will, will will survive in heaven and say, "Well, if you had just done this, if you had just done that, da da da." No, it will be patently clear that everybody chose what they w the reward they got. I think your mentor is going to say in his heart one more time, "Yes, God can be trusted." Yeah. On average, do Seventh-day Adventists praise God as we should? Do we rejoice and praise God in our worship services? We sing songs of praise. We specify times for prayer and singing in our services. Should we have a specific time for praise? Should there be a time for the church community to praise as a group? I, we don't talk about this much anymore, and it, it's, it would be difficult to to do probably in a large church such as one we attend usually here. But Ellen White said very clearly that there should be a time for people each week to stand up and say, okay, this is what happened this week. This is why I'm praising God today. And I, that really impresses me because I had the privilege of working for a short time in the clinic in Nairobi, Kenya. And we we were staying in a, an apartment up on the third floor above the clinic. And there was a built balcony up along there that went, there were three little apartments in a row. And the dentist lived on the end and we lived next to him. And you know, it, it, I, I, it was amazing there because it seemed like every day we would have some opportunity to do some kind of witnessing for God. And so the dentist would come up and the two of us would stand there by the railing and we would say, what have you heard from the Lord today? Mm. It was just amazing. You lived your faith, didn't you? Yeah. Well, we just, I mean, it was amazing. And You know, if you didn't have something to report, the other person would have something to report. Well, obviously there are times when we do not feel like praising God. Think of the Israelites in captivity in Babylon, working as slaves with Babylonians. Eventually the Babylonians figured out that the Jews were good at music and singing, and this is what happened. Psalm 137, verses 1 through 9. By the rivers of Babylon we sat down, there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows nearby we hung up our harps. Those who captured us told us to sing. They told us to entertain them. Sing us a song about Zion. I'm sure they were being a little sarcastic. Mm -hmm. However, what do you think was the response of the Israelites? Babylon, you will be destroyed. Happy are those who pay you back for, which, for what you have done to us, who take your babies and smash them against a rock. Mm. 
does that sound like a good way to end or end a praise a song to God? I mean, you could understand why someone might feel like that after being conquered and forced into slavery. Does it sound like rejoicing and praise? Christians have plenty of reasons for rejoicing and praising God. We need to stop and think about those reasons more frequently, and we need to remember that praising God might actually be a means of witnessing to others. Jim? Horace Williams, Jr., the author of award-winning Unleash the Power of Prayer in Your Life, identifies eight purposes God achieves in our lives when he uses our own suffering for our benefit. According to Williams, God uses suffering to divulge in our lives, excuse me, divulge sin in our lives, develop our faith, demolish our pride, and determine our paths, demonstrate his grace, display his love, deepen our commitment to him, deliver hope, comfort, and joy. Horace Williams, The Furnace of Affliction, God, how God uses our pain and suffering for his purpose. How does God give us joy through suffering? Williams shares that, quotes, joy is more than happiness based on an outcome or circumstance. Joy is a supernatural delight in God's purpose for our lives. Joy is something God, excuse me, something that God offers us in the midst of our pain and suffering. We must choose to live with joy. Williams concludes that experience is, experiencing joy is, doesn't mean that I no longer experience pain. Instead, it means that God is bringing me to a place where I now have an, excuse me, have the inclination to ask him, what do you want me to see in this distressing circumstance, Lord? The Furnace of Affliction, How God Uses Our Pain and Suffering for His Purpose. Pages 90 through 97 from the Bible Study Guide. Well, so what is he suggesting? He's suggesting not that we're happy that we're suffering, not that we're happy of the circumstances we're being put in like that, but can we see something in it that helps us to understand better God and what, he, what happened to him and so forth? What's up to the upside, to, excuse me, what's the upside of this downturn? <laughs> yeah. We know that in New Testament times and shortly thereafter, Christians faced some severe persecution from pagan Roman government for about 300 years. One of the most famous stories that has been reported is the story of Polycarp. Carrie? The uh, Roman Emperor Ant Antoninus plus... Pius. I can't see it, I'm getting... Antoninus Pius. Okay. A.D. 138 through 161 continued Emperor Trajan's policy and practice of persecuting Christians. In A.D. 155, a crowd brought a group of Christians to the authorities of the city of Smyrna in Asia Minor to be convicted and punished. When the Christians refused to acknowledge the gods of the empire, they were punished by death. Mm. They were thrown to the lions, that was in the brackets. Afterward, the crowd demanded that Polycarp, the bishop of the church in Smyrna, be brought before the city. A disciple and friends of Apostle John, the old Polycarp also was a widely known and influential Christian leader in Asia and beyond. beyond rather. When Polycarp finally was brought into the amphitheater, the proconsul tried to persuade him to recant his faith and curse Christ. The faithful disciple of Jesus replied, For 86 years I have served him, and he has done me no evil. How could I curse my king who saved me? When eventually the proconsul condemned him to be burned in the pyre and the soldiers tied him to the stake, Polycarp prayed and praised God with a loud voice, Lord, Sovereign God, I thank you that you have deemed me worthy of this moment, so that jointly with your martyrs I may have a share in the cup of Christ. For this I bless and glory you. Amen. And that's by Justo L. Go uh, Gonzalez, the early church of the dawn of the Reformation. Yes, um, 
<clears throat> Can you imagine praising God and singing as you're being burned to death? But, and if you read the story, they were planning to throw him to the lions, but the lions were so full of other Christians, <laughs> they weren't attacking people anymore. Uh, can you imagine praising God and singing as you're being burned to death? If we had time to review the story in greater depth, we would learn that Polycarp was arrested in a small farming house outside of the city of Smyrna. When the Roman soldiers entered the house, he instructed the woman of the home to prepare something for the soldiers to eat while he stood in the corner and prayed for them. Wow. Mm. Those early Christians had a clear picture of the future life. They regarded that brief time during which they would be dead to be just an interlude leading to their re rejoining other Christians at the second coming. And Ellen White comments about this. Duane? Note these words from Ellen White. Like God's servants of old, many were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Mm -hmm. These called to mind the words of their master that when persecuted for Christ's sake, they were to be exceeding glad, for great would be their reward in heaven, for so the prophets had been persecuted before them. They rejoiced that they were accounted worthy to suffer for the truth, and songs of triumph ascended from the midst of crackling flames." Wow. Looking upward by faith, they saw Christ and angels leaning over the battlements of heaven, gazing upon them with the deepest interest and regarding their steadfastness with approval. A voice came down to them from the throne of God, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Do you remember somebody else who was being stoned that looked up into heaven? Stephen. Stephen, exactly. Rejoicing under very difficult circumstances is possible only when we are, we are very familiar with the one on whose side we have positioned ourselves. We recognize that God is real, that He is good, that He created us, that we are His, and that He loves us and that we love Him back. That the great controversy is real, that it is Satan's attack on God and on us, and that God is on our side and we are on His. That God redeems us from the power of sin and of Satan, and that we are, we and God in Christ are and will be victorious. And that God's cause or mission of bringing salvation to the whole world is worth the suffering we must endure even if we need, if need be, unto death. That's the kind of faith we need to have, and that's the reason why we can praise God. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we continue to praise you. We think about all the wonderful things you've done for us. There's nothing more that we could ask for than your wonderful attention and care for us. May we praise you more, and may we do so more openly before others is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.